Hi everyone, it's MJ. Um, this is primarily for my enterprise risk management students. Um, I'm going to post it on YouTube just because it's, it's the easiest way to, to distribute these things. Um, essentially, it's going to be an audio only. I mean, I'm probably going to put the risk control cycle as the image, but it's going to be the only image. So you can listen to this uh, in the background. The idea is that this is just going to be quite a long monologue uh, just to kind of conclude the virtual workshops. Um, as you know, from the coronavirus, we had to go digital because we couldn't meet in person, um, which for me was a little bit, I mean, like I, I much prefer teaching, um, you know, face to face. It just allows for more interaction, it allows us to have discussions. And also I can then see your guys' faces. Uh, I can see if, you know, if, if people are falling asleep or or if uh, if they're getting bored and I can maybe change the tempo where when you teach virtually or online, you unfortunately don't have that don't have that benefit. Of course, there are some pros. It, it has allowed me to give you guys a little bit more content um, when we do do the presentation face to face. We are limited by those two days where now being virtual, there wasn't really a a limit on how much I could produce for you guys. So that was one of the good things. And the other good thing was that some students weren't able to make the presentations because of work commitments. So it has extended our reach. And I guess that's maybe one of the themes that I want to talk about in this, this conclusion um, voice note is that it's important to see specifically now with the whole coronavirus um, and just specifically for, for enterprise risk management, that there are upsides in crisis. So whenever there's something bad happens, it's very important that we can see, as the cliche says, the silver lining. Um, and that's one of the things that this subject tries to distinguish itself from traditional risk management. So traditional risk management, it looked at risks in silos, and it was very much like the, the fun police. Um, enterprise risk management wants to have a holistic look, and by being holistic, it also wants to look at the upside risks as well. It wants to look at the opportunities, and it understands that risk management can sometimes bring down the bad and the good, and if it's bringing down the good more than it is bringing down the bad, then maybe it's something that shouldn't be done. So very, very important to always consider and remember the upside. And um, I know I said this quite a lot in the first presentation, but I did give you guys some, some homework to do, uh, some assignments. Um, not everybody did it, uh, which, is, which is to be expected. I mean, doing these presentations for a while, not all the students do the homework. Uh, but the ones that do, there's always a few of them who do forget to mention the, the upsides. And like I said, it can be a little bit difficult. I mean, you look at now this pandemic, you know, are there any upsides? I did read some fun article that now that no one's at the zoo, uh, pandas are actually breeding for the first time in captivity. And it's like, oh, wow, who, who knew you just had to give the little pandas a little bit of privacy? Um, you know, so there's, there's like a small, small amount of, of feel good uh, stories out there. The other one is that pollution is coming down. People are being able to see the Himalayas from their towns for the first time. Um, although it's, it's, it's uh, probably not the best time to be talking about upsides because I think this coronavirus has, I mean, you know, the, the downside has definitely outweighed any, any pros. Um, and the one thing that we're seeing with this coronavirus is kind of what we saw with the, the credit crunch of 2008. And that is how these risks kind of compile on top of each other. It's like one thing collapses and it's that systemic risk where everything starts collapsing now as well. And one of the assignments I, I, I gave you guys to do, um, but very few of you did this one, was just seeing, you know, how does the pandemic affect various different industries? And some industries is actually going to, to help maybe in the short run, um, an industry like, let's say, video games and Netflix. Uh, the reason why I say only in the short, short term is because in the long term, it is going to destroy or damage their ability to produce new games or produce new TV shows. So I think this pandemic is overall bad for everyone. Some companies are enjoying a little bit of a short term boost. Um, specifically, I mean, let's say there's, there's companies that provide online examinations. This is like, oh my gosh, this is amazing time for them. They're never getting so much demand uh, as they've ever got before. And I think this pandemic is going to maybe shift a big perspective. And if 
they can do their job well and show that online exams can be done, then this might create like a whole new industry for them and, and actually bring you know, quite a lot of benefits. Of course, um, online exam industry is minute compared to the rest of the world. And I mean, stuff like tourism and restaurants and, and you know, just like if you think about it, sports stadiums, they are getting hit quite, quite hard. But anyway, the whole point that I want to make is that the, that one piece of homework that I gave you guys to do was to think about how does this pandemic affect all the other industries. So we went through pension funds, medical aid, short-term insurers, banks, uh, asset managers, as well as a whole bunch of non-financial firms such as you know airlines, uh, the gaming industry, movies, restaurants, tourism, hotel chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And why it's quite a good exercise to do this is to see how coronavirus is going to affect them is that you can then see the systemic risks and what are going to be some of the knock-on effects. Um, it's it's difficult to try and see any upside, specifically in, say, industries like tourism. Uh, but if you can try and see a little bit of that silver lining, then that's great. And I think this is, again, it's, it's a challenge for this enterprise risk management subject is because you need a mindset that is incredibly cynical and pessimistic to find the downside risks and to, to identify them. But at the same time, you need to be optimistic and hopeful and a little bit of an opportunist in order to see that, okay, there actually are some, some upsides. Um, but I mean, yeah, maybe just last thing on the whole coronavirus, it's, 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 it's weird. This is kind of where we now in crisis management mode, you know, risk management is what you do before the disaster strikes. Coronavirus has now happened. Um, and it's weird. We kind of, it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's almost too late for, for risk management. Of course, the big thing now is to try and learn from this, this pandemic, treat it like a case study so that when we do recover from it in the future, um, maybe people will be more willing to listen to risk management and they might consider, okay, yeah, let's maybe, maybe it's a good idea if businesses have, say, cash reserves that can cover a whole year of expense if no profit comes in. This is what we're seeing some companies like BMW have done. And it will be interesting to see, you know, say two years time where they are compared to all of their, their competitors. But like I said, I just wanted this this work, uh, the, sorry, this final uh, voice note, just to kind of wrap things up. And like I said, in the, the very first workshop, the two things that I suggest when it comes to, to studying, it's, um, it's interrogation and it's mythology. These are my two alternative study techniques that you guys can, can play around with. Uh, mythology is just kind of like turning this whole thing into a story. Um, choose a story that you want to use. I know in my presentations, I used uh, dragons and gold. And for those of you who also enjoy fantasy, I think it, it, it went quite nicely with you. But for, for those of you who don't like fantasy, not a fan of Lord of the Rings, um, you might be like, this is a little bit weird. But the whole idea with mythology is you can use whatever story you want to try and connect all the different pieces of material that you're learning and try to create vivid imagery that's going to help with memorization. Um, of course, this is the one thing that's going to make this online exam for you a little bit uh, interesting is the fact that I think that they've let, made it open book. I'm not 100% not sure how the exam is going to be run, so don't quote me on this, but it looks like it might be open book. And that's a big temptation for some of you to now not try and do memorization, not to try and learn the book work off by heart because you're going to think, oh, you've got access to it all. But like I've, I've said in some of the other voice notes I've been sending to the group, that is a dangerous game to play because you might very well run out of time. It's much, much better to learn everything off by heart, treat this as if you're not going to have access to your book work and just you know go in there and learn it to such an ability that when the question comes, you can just write it down straight away. You're not wasting two or three minutes per question trying to page through your book to find it. And remember, they this this type of exam, especially at this level, not that much is going to be based purely on just knowing the the core reading. Not just you know, it's not just going to be oh regurgitate the the theory. It's going to be at a much higher level. They're going to be testing your synthetic intelligence, or I don't know whatever they whatever they call it, the the, the higher order skills. Um, 
And then it essentially comes into the interrogation technique, which is asking questions. You know, a lot of us spend a lot of time learning the the what and the hows, whereas your higher order questions are more the the whys and the when. You know, when do we do this risk management strategy? Why do we do this risk management strategy? You know, those are some of the questions that I want you to be thinking about while you're going through and while you're revising your your material. So try to create a story around it if you can. Um, I know we're actuaries and creativity and literature is probably not our, our strong suit, but if you can do it, like I say, I, I would, it, it's, it's working wonders for me. Um, some of the students from the previous workshop said it helped them a lot. So give it a go if you are struggling to, to memorize all the content. And like I said, don't rely too much on the fact that this exam is, is open book because you are going to get penalized with regards to, to time. So just want to give a warning on that side. And then, like I said, use the interrogation technique while you're studying. So whenever you come across a piece of material, you can ask, what is this? How is it done? When is it done? Why is it done? Who is it done by? And if you can start doing that, then you're going to be able to not only answer these exam questions, but you're going to get a really good understanding of the subject. So if we maybe take a step back and come to the, the, the risk control cycle, which is probably like I've said, if you're watching this, it'll be on the, the screen. Um, it's important to, to actually go out and just look at other risk control cycles. I mean, the Paul Sweeting textbook has quite a few towards the end. Um, if you read those IAA notes at the, at the end of the core reading, they also have some interesting diagrams that you can kind of use. This is the one that then I created. And like I said, the big thing to do is to interrogate this risk control cycle. So if you see, we're starting at awareness. You can maybe ask, well, why are we starting at awareness and not at identifying? Like, why do we have this awareness step? And it's this whole idea that if you're not aware that risks exist, you're not going to be looking for them. And that might sound very, very strange to us actuaries because we've been dealing with risks since first year, uh, you know, since first year university. But it's important to appreciate that risk is, is quite an abstract concept that, you know, not many people, specifically, um, you know, small, small businesses consider too much. And I mean, if you had to go around and do a survey and just ask people, how would you define risk? you're going to get quite a lot of different answers. I mean, this is one thing we even did in the workshop. I asked everyone, you know, what is, is risk? And, you know, some people were like, oh, it's uncertainty. Other people were, oh, it's chance. Um, but it's important to realize it's the consequences that are attached to uncertainty. Remember, if there's no consequence to the, to the uncertainty, then it's not a risk. Like if you just flip a coin, heads or tails, no one cares. It's only when you put a bet that there's something that you could potentially lose or potentially win, you know, that's what we call our, our consequence, that something becomes a risk. So the first step, if you're applying the enterprise uh, risk management framework to, to a business, specifically a small-time business, is to get them to be aware that their business is taking on risk or using the mythology uh, metaphor, you know, make them aware that there are dragons guarding the piles of gold that they're going after. You know, stuff can go wrong. Look, I think after this whole coronavirus pandemic, more people are going to be aware of risk and the, the, you know, the fact that business can get disrupted and all these, these uncertainties than they were maybe before. And you can see what I've done in my risk control cycle is I've trying to make everything linked to the risk profile. I think the risk profile is the holy grail of the subject. Um, it's one of the big uses of the capital models is that you can use your capital model to determine what your risk profile is. Think if you don't know what your risk profile is, you don't know how much capital to hold. So if you can figure out how much capital to hold, you can also calculate what your risk profile is. So the risk profile, incredibly difficult to, to define. Like I say, it's the holy grail. It's, it's, some people think it can't be done, but it is our objective as, as risk managers, risk analysts, is to try and quantify what this risk profile is. And what risk awareness does is that it sets it up. It says, okay, we're prepared to try and figure out this risk profile. Um, and we can also try and make some early statements about 
what we want our risk profile to be, you know, what are our objectives, uh, what is our risk appetite, what is our risk tolerance, um, is, if there's regulation involved, you know, specifically with financial businesses, you know, what are our risk capacities, um, if we look at our balance sheet, what are our risk limits given our current uh, resources. So the step one it's it's just becoming aware that there is this thing called a risk profile and there is this thing that we need to be mindful of. Now, it's unfortunate because a lot of the risk control cycles that I see out in the literature exclude this step. And I don't think it's because they don't think it's important. I think it's because they're taking it for granted or so much of the time it's, you know, they're looking at financial organizations and this is a bit of a no-brainer. But what this exam loves to do, it loves to question, you know, these risk management uh, principles to non-financial firms. And those non-financial firms, like I said, sometimes aren't that aware of risk as the financial firms are. And therefore, it's very important that this is your first step. Now, of course, you can interrogate this. You can say, okay, so we've answered why uh, we have risk awareness. We've spoken a little bit about what risk awareness is. We've spoken about when to do it right at the beginning. Uh, but you can also ask, well, um, who will do it? You know, who in the business, uh, whose responsibility is it to be aware of risk? And it's, it's a good question because in different organizations, it's going to be down to different people. It could be the founder of a, of a startup. It could be the, the board. It could be the trustees. Depending on the organization, there could be different people. So it's, it's not an easy question to, to answer, like, or give a blanket answer. It is something where you need to read the question, try and think, okay, who in this organization, which stakeholder is most likely going to be aware of risk? And once we've done that, we can now move on to uh, the second step, which is to identify risk. You know, And this is one thing that we, we spend quite a bit of time doing um, at the workshops was, you know, trying to identify various risks. We had those, those different organizations. Um, I think we had, yeah, we had Formula One, we had Taylor Swift, we had the Pet Hotel. I think we had a casino. I, I don't know. I had different ones for Cape Town and I had different ones for, for Joburg. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it was, it was trying to, to develop the skill of identifying risks. And this is such an important step because if you don't identify the risk, you're not going to be able to do the, the assessments, the managing and the monitoring. So it's worthwhile spending a good deal of time as a business in identifying your risks and populating something called the risk register, which very much forms the skeleton of your, of your risk profile. And different risks are going to uh, be relevant for different industries. And that's why I said it, it, it was quite a nice exercise to look at how, you know, what are the, the other risks or, or how coronavirus is going to affect all those different organizations, all the different financial firms, all the, the different non-financial ones, because it really teases out their vulnerabilities. And if you can identify vulnerabilities, well, most likely you're going to see uh, that's where risks are. And vulnerabilities can be reliance on key people. It can be reliance on various um, third parties. It can be reliances on, on various systems or, or equipment. So you can kind of see, um, or, or one of the things coronavirus does is that it's, it's taken certain things away from businesses and we're seeing how they're struggling. And, and that's like, okay, those are our risks. Once we get out of this thing, we can see that they rely too much on this person or too much on that, that system. So risk identification, it is a difficult thing to do. It is a little bit of a skill. It is something to practice. Um, and this is probably where you want to become quite cynical, uh, like I said, to identify the vulnerabilities. But at the same time, like I said, you want to be optimistic. You want to maybe put on a little bit of an entrepreneur's cap and try and identify, well, are there any opportunities as well? I mean, you look at, at a company like, let's say, Disney. Fortunately for them, they released that Disney Plus, you know, that thing to compete with Netflix, which is going to be really great because it's going to offset the risk of the coronavirus shutting down all of their, their theme parks. So identifying risk could even be saying, OK, guys, maybe we need to create a business unit that offsets the risks 
of these other places. And because Disney, you know, what, one of their biggest assets is their brand, um, and they already had all of these movies, um, you know, it was quite simple for them to make an online streaming service because they already had the content, they already had um, a reputation with, with the population. So at this stage as well, it's, it's really good to identify uh, potential projects that could maybe offset or mitigate some of the risks that you've identified. Um, and this therefore makes, when we have to maybe interrogate, we say, well, who should be identifying risks? It should very well be, you know, the, the top management. Yes, maybe get a, a risk consultant in to, to help or, or maybe your own risk committee to, to assist. But I would say that it's critical to have some form of executive leadership part of this uh, brainstorming activity because it is something that will influence the strategy of the business overall. So it's a critical, critical step. And it's not just, and this is like, I think what risk management, you know, that you know, before we had enterprise risk management, traditional risk management was kind of like, it drew up a checklist. It was like, do we have any credit risk? No. Do we have any market risk? No. Do we have operational risk? Maybe. And then they moved on. And I really, really am not a fan of the risk checklist uh, method. Why? Because um, risks, I don't think the, the, the categories of risks are too broad. They're ill-defined. So it's much better to look at your business um, as a unique entity. Yes, maybe learn from case studies and you know do some research and see what is maybe affecting other businesses and see if it's if it's influencing you. But it is very important that you treat your company as a unique thing rather than just applying a blanket checklist. If you apply a blanket checklist, you are going to miss out on risks. And maybe that's the final risk that you want to identify is the fact that there are still unknown risks that you haven't identified. And I think that's what the coronavirus very much fitted in that category. Um, so one thing I also recommend for doing for this exam is reading financial statements of various companies. So the one that I did just for interest sake was I was reading through the financial statements of Discovery, it's a medical aid, and it was interesting to read through their risk register and they did not have pandemic um, in this thing. They had medical inflation. Um, what else did they have that I was, I was reading in? It was, yeah, it, there wasn't, I remember, yeah, they, they had like around six or seven key risks that they were worried about. Uh, this was, remember, this was made last year, 2019, and pandemic was just nowhere in it. And it's something that, I don't think, or well, I've yet to see actually a a financial company that had pandemic as one of the key risks that they were actively managing or or preparing for. And so this whole coronavirus would have fallen under the unknown risk that we're unaware of, uh, that we don't even know what it's going to be. And the reason why you want to maybe do that is because that then does allow you to, when you maybe cap calculate your capital for your risk profile at the end of the day, that might be uh, allow you to make the case to say, okay, guys, the model says we should do $10 million. I say we should maybe do 12 million, you know, put in that extra 20% as a cushion, just to just in case there was something that we didn't see. It's a very prudent approach. And if you can make a case for it, then you can tame the shareholders who, like I said, they very much don't want um, too much capital set as reserves because that is going to dilute their returns. So it is a bit of a balancing game that you need to play. So you can't just say, okay, we're going to hold 15 million because regulators might get a little bit too upset by that. But it is always worth, specifically from an actuarial point of view, is to always push for the prudent side to try and make a case to hold more capital rather than less capital. Remember, we we do have a little bit of a, it's not like doctors, we've taken like a Hippocratic oath, but we do need to be mindful of all other stakeholders and the implications that if some of these big companies were to fail, you know, how devastating that could be on the employers and on their families. And therefore, you know, we're not just putting companies to make the shareholders happy. Uh, we are putting there to make sure that all stakeholders um, are, you know, represented and 
you know, all of their risks have kind of been been measured and understood. So, like I say, you always want to make a, and if that's why, if you can try and make a case, the more risks that you can identify, the more capital you can recommend that is is held. That's going to be more things in your in your model. So, talking about model, let's maybe move on to on to step three, which was like I say, measuring. Um, this is where you assess the risks and you try to put a numerical value to it. Now. This is probably the most controversial place of the subject um, because on the one hand, we have developed really sophisticated mathematical models. I mean, there's the copulas, which I don't know if you guys have seen the course already on Udemy. The mathematics there, it's incredibly sophisticated. Um, there's extreme value theory as as well. You know, we've got all these beautiful and wonderful models that have the risk of giving us overconfidence. We think, oh, because we have all this uh, magical maths, we're able to now measure all in and every risk, and therefore we, we have a lot of confidence in the values that we find. But it's important to appreciate that the models are most likely going to be wrong. Uh, the models are unable to capture all of the various things that could happen. Like I said, I think a lot of the models were not picking up coronavirus. They were completely blind to it. Um, so this is the thing. When you use your model, you need to understand that it is vulnerable. It is not a silver bullet. It doesn't just sort out your problem. If anything, it's just a tool to aid in the decision-making process, but it is not gospel. And this is one thing that the exam loves to test. So a lot of students get a little bit hung up with the mathematics and, you know, oh, how, how do I do this extreme value theory? And, oh, I need to integrate the normal distribution. And it's like, oh, crazy, crazy uh, maths. But if you look at the past papers, the exam's more interested in knowing the story around the models, knowing when do models, you know, when are models used, how are they made, who who is responsible for them, when are they deployed, rather than the actual mathematics. Yes, you could be asked a mathematical question in this exam, and that has occurred, but the more likely question that's going to pop up is, okay, what are the principles of, of modeling? And describe model risk or describe the steps in preparing the model. So very, very important when it comes to this step over here, too many students focus too much on the mathematics. And yes, understanding the maths is important, but it's very, very important that you can also understand the framework that these models are being put in. You understand their limitations and you understand more about how to apply them in the general sense than rather knowing the specifics of each and every model. Um, also, it's important to understand that some risks are very difficult to measure. Like, let's say, reputation risk. How do you put a numerical figure to that? And this is where some, some textbooks talk about quantitative and qualitative uh, risks, and there's different approaches that you kind of need to take regarding them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's also good to realize that the numbers that you're coming onto should link up with the risks you identified. So you kind of have your risk register, you kind of list all the risks out there, what are, you know, what's the source of the risk, what's the consequence going to be, um, and now you can use this, the model to measure, okay, well, what is going to be the severity of that consequence and what is going to be the frequency of, the, of that event actually popping up. And what you can then do, or one thing that we, we sometimes see, is they create something called a, a risk map. And that's kind of, you have frequency and you have severity as your axis, and then you kind of put your little risks on this, on this graph. And then um, you will then look at this and you'll say, okay, once we've done that, we can move to the next step, which is managing. And I think, yeah, this, this was in some of the Udemy courses where you can almost split up that risk map into four quadrants. You know, if something's got a high frequency and a high severity, you want to just avoid that risk because that is just going to, that is something that you don't want to deal with because that's going to just ruin your business. So if, if something has got a high risk, um, oh, sorry, a high frequency and a high severity, better to just close that business down, walk away. 
If it's got a high severity and a low frequency, that's when you're gonna to look to transfer it. So remember, there's many different ways of transferring risk. You can use derivatives, you can use various contracts, you can use insurance. Um, it's important that you go and you learn the, the nitty gritty of each of the various techniques around transferring it. Um, Remember we said if the severity is low and the, the frequency is low, then you'll maybe retain that. If the frequency is high and the severity is low, then that's maybe where you'll uh, introduce um, internal controls or, or various other risk policies that, that should be, be done by employees to try and reduce that frequency. Um, and then the important thing is, and I guess the risk control cycle that I'm showing it doesn't really show it to you, but once you've managed your risks, you should actually go back and re-measure them. So once you've managed, once you've introduced these strategies, you should go back and redo the, the modeling stage uh, and create a new heat map and see, okay, have, have we decreased the severity and the frequency adequately? And, or is the cost of implementing all these management strategies um, and, you know, is that cost lower than the benefits um, that we're going to be enjoying from the risks decreasing with their, with their frequency and their severity? If the answer is no, then maybe try a different strategy. Um, so this, I mean, like I said, I should maybe update this risk control cycle and have this as like a little bit of an interloop where the assessment and management will kind of go through each other until the strategy has been found. Um, once the strategy has been found, you then implement it. Um, once it's been implemented, it's not like, okay, cool, job done, go home. You then come to the final stage, which is monitoring. Uh, this is when you check the actual, you compare it to the expected, and if it's very different, then you start firing people. No, you don't start firing people. Um, you start asking a lot more questions. You, you say, well, why was the actual and expected so different? Was there a problem with my model? Did the source of uncertainty change? Or, oh, no, wait, there was this big global impact called the coronavirus that kind of stuffed up everything, and that's why our actual versus expected was very, very different. Um, but once you've monitored risks, it then should feed back into awareness, because like I said, maybe you should be like, okay, we should now be more aware of pandemic risks and the effect that a lockdown could have, you know, how it could stretch our liquidity, how it can, you know, make our employees depressed, how it can, you know, make us lose customers, uh, but how it can also maybe create opportunities for us to do more things online or, you know, we can now do remote uh, working, which could maybe reduce our rent. Uh, you know, we don't have to pay so much for rent. Maybe our employees can spend less time in the traffic. You know, so you do want to try and see a little bit of the, like I said, of the silver lining. But it's important to see how monitoring feeds back into awareness. Now, a good thing to do is to go and I think one of, one, one of the things that they sometimes create in the financial business financial conduct reports, I think that's what they're called. Go and Google them. Go and Google as many risk reports that you can from actual businesses. They don't necessarily have to be from South Africa. They can be from any country out there. And just see how they lay out these risk reports. You know, too much of us, we spend time reading the textbooks and all these other things, and we focus so much on the theory it really is beneficial to actually see how this is done in practice. So I do wanna encourage you guys to go out, download financial statements, download financial conduct reports, download you know whatever the regulation says that they need to do, go and actually read the whole document from start to end. It's, it's, it is boring, like it's, it's not like a JK Rowling uh, novel that's gonna keep you riveted and it's gonna be like, ooh, a magical storyline. No, it is quite dry, but it is worth going through because you are gonna see like certain terms. You're gonna be like, hey, hold on, I, I recognize that from you know that part in the textbook or ooh, they're not referring to it as economic capital, they're referring to it as risk capital. Is there a difference between those two terms? Um, you know, and it can, it can open other doors for you to explore and, and check out what, what's happening. So I really, really want to encourage you guys to go onto the internet and look for various other reports. We do have the WhatsApp group, so if you find a good one, and you feel like being a good person, please share it on the WhatsApp group so that the other students can also benefit from it as well. And I think that'll encourage them to then share whatever they found with you. So it's kind of like the more you help the group, the more the group's gonna 
going to help you back. So a little bit of a little bit of synergy there that I think we can take advantage of. Um, so yeah, I mean, how how long have I been talking for now? I've been talking for thirty five minutes. Uh, so yeah, let's maybe like I say, that's what I basically just wanted to do in this 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 giant monologue was to just recap the risk control cycle, show you that because while we've been making the Udemy courses, each of these things kind of, you know, they're their own courses. They feel like they're in isolation, which a lot of us can, you know, relate to because we're in our own self-isolation. But it's important to see that all of these courses fit into this risk control cycle. It's important to see the, the synergies, the complete picture, the holistic approach. So, like I want to say is, or one thing I did say also in the workshop was you don't want to be reading the same material twice. If you've read James Lum's uh, textbook, move on to Paul Sweeting's. If you've read Paul Sweeting's textbook, move on to one online. Um, read other stuff. Don't, like I know some of us, specifically with the early actuarial subjects where we only had like one textbook on this, you know, on life contingencies or something, and we would read it like 10 times. I don't want you to take that approach. It is very, very important that you get a very broad perspective of risk management uh, because in these exams, they do like to throw you curveballs. This is a specialist um, you know, level. This isn't, this, and for some of you, this might be your first specialist subject, so you're not aware that there is quite a, you know, the difficulty level has increased substantially. So you need to be prepared for these difficult questions. And one of the ways to do that is to just read broadly, um, check up on case studies. But like I say, try to find those financial reports, read them. Uh, regulation, it's actually another golden source. Go onto the Solvency 2 website and try to read as much on Solvency 2, on Basel Accords. Watch presentations that people have done on these things, on these regulations. I know it's boring, but you're going to pick up gems inside that that is going to help you really really excel in this exam and i think maybe just the last thing on the exam is that i think everybody is aware that this coronavirus has stressed us out to new you know a lot of us are struggling a lot of us are dealing with depression and you know we're emotionally down and we've lost motivation to to study um some of the actuaries have been given tremendous more amount of work to do uh, to try and you know salvage some business situations and all that type of stuff. So I think everybody knows that emotionally this is a very, very difficult time for all of us. So to try and write an exam as well, I just want to say if you are going to still write the exam, fantastic. That is brilliant. That is, that is really, really brave of you. I understand quite a lot of students have dropped out from this exam and that's completely understandable. Like I say, it is really, really hard to try and study under these circumstances. But maybe this is where a little bit of hope comes in, is you're almost getting a free shot at these exams. If you fail this exam, no one is going to hold it against you. And I think quite a lot of um, um, companies, normally they say, oh, if you fail the exam, you get less study leave the next time you write it. I think those things are going to probably be waived under the certain circumstances. So if you are still writing the exam, you're kind of getting a free attempt. No one is going to uh, judge you if you fail this time. So be relaxed. Don't stress too much about it. Worst case happens is that you have to write it again in September. I am going to be making a lot more content on risk management for the September because it's, it's quite likely that um, you know September workshops will also be done uh, digitally. So there'll be even more material for you guys to go through. So you'll definitely smash it in, in September once things have calmed down. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to try and pass it now. We understand that this is a difficult time emotionally. So like I say, if you are still writing the exam, that is well done. I mean, that is very, very, very brave of you. So keep studying. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but um, let's do our best. Who knows? Maybe the examiners have gone light on us and they ask us a really easy paper and we're just really well prepared for it. So hopefully that is going to be be our situation. But yeah, I just want to say um, thank you so much for, for, yeah, for listening till the end. Thank you so much for watching all of the Udemy courses. If any of you guys do have any questions, please feel free to ask them either on the WhatsApp group or messaging me directly on WhatsApp, and I will do my best to, to answer it. 
what are we? We are now the 20 something of April, the 23rd. So we have basically, we have a week and a day until the exam. So let's do it. Let's try and let's try and give it our best. Let's try to stay motivated. And at the end of the day, I just want to wish you all best of luck. But John, I'll see you guys more on the WhatsApp group if you have any more questions. Keep well. Cheers.